I've lived through so many wars. The entire area I lived my life in is almost completely decimated. Explain what life was like before 7th of October. I think you would be surprised uh, by how much faith dire situations give you. Mm. Were, you even, were you free? Describe free. Any people put under extreme oppression uh, and constant violations of their rights, they will rise up and their, their faith will increase. At the time of recording, the death toll in Gaza has reached above 10,000, yet the so-called international community, in reality the Western nations are deaf to the cries under the rubble. The Israeli war machine no longer worries about red lines as they act with complete impunity. If the hypocrisy of the West was not evident before the crisis, it is clear now that the liberal world order was never meant to safeguard the lives and honour of those it deems lesser people. Today I speak to Amr Abdul Latif, who was until recently a resident and citizen of Gaza. He came to the UK to study his postgraduate degree at St Andrews University and now works as a software developer. The Western press, even those that show a little empathy, present the people of Gaza as lesser human beings who do not have dreams and aspirations like the rest of us, who are either pitied or presented as subhuman. I want to understand what life has been like since 2007 when Israel announced its siege and what the average person in Gaza actually believes. Amr Abdul Latif, Assalamu Alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to The Thinking Muslim. Wa Alaikum Assalam wa rahmatullah. It's very nice to be here. I've been a long time fan of the podcast and I'm uh, very happy to be finally like talking with you in here. Barakallah Fik. In fact, for our viewers, uh, we met on uh, one of the protests. We bumped yes. into each other and got speaking. Yes. Alhamdulillah, I mean, from our first maybe five minutes into the discussion, I asked you, you need to come on the, the podcast because uh, subhanAllah, your story is... Uh, is really amazing and I pray that, uh, well let's actually start with your family. Um, you know, we've been watching the scenes on social media and it's just heartbreaking. I mean, how's your, how's your family at the moment? Um, when it comes to my family, um, we've, uh, m my family uh, fled from the, like from Gaza City to the southern part um, of the Strip. Mm. Um, if we if we want to draw a scene of, of what's happening, just just so viewers could have a better idea, uh, because it's very easy to see the images and not really understand the the level of destruction that Gaza is seeing right now, I think is unforeseen, like unprecedented, I mean, in 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 many of the of the conflicts of this uh of this century and even like from World War II, it's it's an insane level of destruction. Uh, I've lived through so many wars. I've lived through the uh, civil war in 2006. I lived through uh, 2008, 2009, uh, Al-Furqan War. I lived through uh, 2012, uh, the war when, uh, when Israel decided to bomb uh, one of the top military leaders uh, in Al-Qassam Brigade. I lived through uh, 2014, a 51 day war, uh, which was massive, massive in its scale. It, it's a 51 day war. Uh, it's unusual for Israel to go for a, a long war. And that was one of them. Uh, and I lived through uh, all the escalations from then until uh, 2021, including the Great March of Return and some of the, uh, some of the smaller conflicts that happened as well, like escalations every now and then that would last for like a day or two or three days mm. uh, until 2021 which was like a 12-day uh, confrontation um, that kind of changed the, uh, the equations. And I lived, uh, I lived through the ones after uh, when Israel just out of the blue decided to target some of the top military leaders in Islamic Jihad uh, party uh, and uh, Saray al-Quds, their brigades. Um, what, I, what I need to get across is the level of destruction we're seeing now if you combine all the all the confrontations we've had before and you add on top of them many of the other conflicts that the world is seeing right now, mm. it could probably just still not match it. Uh, when, when I want to just describe like a small image, usually in wars, 
uh, Israel doesn't target heavily populated areas. It usually decides to, to target some houses, thinks there are going to be a few people there. If I do a massacre there, not a lot of people will notice. It won't make big news. Uh, and I won't have to explain myself, basically. They then, as situations came and went, they started uh, raising that level to start targeting high-rise buildings in, in Gaza, like towers, like 10 to 12 story uh, uh, buildings. And each one of them is a landmark in Gaza because we don't have that many of them. Um, so when they take any one of them, we feel it. We feel it. it's it's a strong statement of uh, it's a terrorizing statement that you can't do anything to us and we'll keep you down. Uh, so when uh, whenever that happens, it's a huge pain. But then they started this war, they started this attack with targeting some of the like most famous uh, high-rise buildings in Gaza, like Burj Watan and Burj Palestine. And, uh, and some others. And then they started targeting the heavy, uh, like heavily, the densely populated areas, completely ignoring what we've, uh, what we've come to know throughout the many years. Um, so people usually fled from their houses to the heavily, like to the densely populated areas. That's, that's, that's the usual, that's what we've been doing. Common sense, yeah. Yes, and my family did that at the beginning of the war because we know how, how Israel deals with things. Mm. We understand it. So my family did that. We went to uh, we went from Rimal al Janubi, which is the place where we're in, to uh, to uh, to a Rimal. Basically, I, I don't know. How to, like you don't know Gaza, so you didn't uh, mm -hmm. I understand really what I'm talking about. But we went to a Rimal. But the first thing Israel said on that war was evacuate a Rimal because I want to bomb it. Right. That's the first thing that happened. This now, is Rimal, a civilian area. This is the, let's say, the most central part of Gaza. Right. It is the place, like the economic hub. There's so many shops there. There's right. a few malls because we don't have many of them. There's a few malls there. It's a, uh, it's full of people. It has the like the all the banks, the the, the main branches of all the banks. Like it's it's the main area. They started this war by bombing the entire area of Rimal, including Ash-Shuhad Street, including the two uh, uh, like high-rise towers I've, I've talked about, like uh, Burj Watan and uh, like Watan and uh, Palestine Towers. Mm. The entire area I lived my life in up to this point uh, is almost completely decimated, including the university I studied in, Islamic University of Gaza including the place where I used to sit around with my friends. Uh, or, or, well, we used to sit in many places, but that's one of the main places, al Katiba mm. field, which, which is opposite of uh, Islamic University of Gaza towards the sea. Uh, they've bombed that, they've bombed the entire region. They even bombed al Katiba Mosque, one of the most famous uh, mosques in the city. Uh, and I have many friends all around that area. The place where I used to live in, the same building I used to live in, was bombed. Uh, I have many friends living inside it, and I don't, I still don't know if they made it out or not. These are your school friends, your childhood friends. My friends from my entire life. Uh, Gaza is really small. We all know each other. Like, mm -hmm. if, if anything happens to anyone, we all know. We all know. Basically, we're two million people, yes, but we're living in such a small area. Uh, that we simply all know each other. You wouldn't walk in the street without saying hi to like a few dozen people. Mm. Uh, and it pains my heart to say this, but I think it's, it's going to take decades for, for Gaza to go back where it was. And it may, it may never, may never go back to it. And how's your family? Yeah. So my, my family right now made it to the southern part. Okay. Um, so they fled to Arimal and then fled from Arimal to another place, uh, but then fled from that other place to the south. No, actually back to their house because their house is not uh, in a densely populated area. And uh, since they're bombing densely populated areas, we might as well just go back to our house. Mm -hmm. Well, we know it, we know the area. We mm -hmm. have uh, 
uh, we have solar cells in the house, so we like at least we would have electricity. Yeah. Um, but uh, they started threatening with the ground invasion and everything, and the ground invasion would most likely get to us, and evidently it has. So right now the tanks are near my house. There is clashes there, and there it's most likely uh, hit at least by a few tank shells and artillery shells. Yes. Uh, but my family made it to the southern part. Now, there, if I want to talk a bit more about my family, I could tell you about my cousin, my cousin Hiba. Mm. Um, she was killed with her uh, husband and all her children in an uh, Israeli airstrike uh, just a few days after like the war started. Um, she's like three, she has like three children. Each one of them is like uh, four, six, and eight. The really, really. Uh, small children, uh, young children, I mean. And uh, and I also have uh, two others uh, of my cousins. And now, in Gaza, we say, my cousin, if it's your uh, father's cousin, <laughs> it's your cousin as well. Yes. I don't know if you have that as yes, well. Yes, we do. Yes. You do have it, yes. okay. So I, I would say my cousins, if they're my father's cousins, and if they're my father's uh, cousin's sons, as well, we still say cousin. Yes. Uh, so, so two others of my, uh, so they're not direct cousins. So, but they're, they're very close family. Uh, so two others of my cousins as well were uh, were killed uh, yeah. with their wives and uh, and children. And uh, as the war is going on, every single day we're losing, we're losing so many, so many great people. Uh, and if I were to just continue talking about the people I've, like, I know mm. who we've lost, it, it would probably take the entire podcast. Uh, so, yeah, uh, oh. one one person that we lost this morning was uh, Professor uh, Ismail Astal, a, a renowned professor in mathematics in, in Gaza, one of the geniuses in uh, in Gaza. Mm. It's a huge loss to, to lose that person. I studied under him and so did uh, generations of students in the Islamic University. Uh, but it's a huge loss now. The entire university is gone and he's gone too. And as well as like many other professors as well in the university. So that's only today, this morning. Uh, and from his family, just, just I'll end with this one. Yeah. His family is Al Astal family. I don't know if you've heard about the report that the Ministry of Health released. Uh, detailing the the names and uh, ID numbers mm. and ages of yes. around 7,000 uh, killed people. In that report, which, which came out like a week or a half, a week and a half ago, 88 people of Al Astal family were killed. 88 people. Just imagine that number. 88 people. And this morning they targeted the same family again mm. in Khan Yunis. Now Khan Yunis is in the southern part. It is the supposed safe part. Yes. And they targeted them again and are killing again of the same family. And I think they may have crossed the 100 threshold oh. of, of deaths in the same family. Now you can imagine what's, what that means for the rest of the people. Amar, is there any doubt in your mind that this is collective punishment? I mean, the, the Israeli argument is that um, we're targeting... Hamas operatives in various parts of the city and they hide behind uh, human shields, they hide behind uh, civilians. In your mind, is this really trying to subdue an entire population? In, in terms of uh, like Israel's history, like anyone, anyone that knows anything about Israel's history would know that in its doctrine, collective punishment is something that they know and do in every single in every single like as a response to every single violence uh, from the Palestinian side in history it used to be like if a person resisted mm. right uh, say for example they resisted a soldier and managed to get managed to get that soldier right they would see where that person is from which village he's from and they would go on a pogrom just to hit and kill and burn that village. And that continues to this day in the West Bank. So for example, in Huwara, this is very recent, like I'm, I'm not even, I'm not even talking about the current 
كونفليكت ان ان لايك بيفور 7th اوف اكتوبر بس ستيل فيري ريسنت حواره ون بيرسون فروم حواره ايه ال ريزيستنس فايتر بيزيكلي هي هي كيلد ا فيو ا فيو بيبل فروم از اي ثينك اي واز ون اور تو بيبل ناو اون ذا وات وات هابند افتر وورز واز ذا ذا اسرائيلي ميليشيز ذا تيرورست ميليشيز لايك ذا سيتلر تيرورست ميليشيز ونت انتو حواره اند بارند سو ماني اوف ذا بروبرتيز اند شوت ات بيبل ان ذا ستريتس They, they raised the city and the minister of uh, finance came out and said uh, I want to wipe Hawara off the map and uh, well uh, that, that statement was condemned by Western uh, politicians because it happened before the 7th of October mm. but after the 7th of October these statements became uh, well known and uh, and even encouraged I would say from uh, like no one really cares if, if anyone says anything right now uh, in terms of collective punishment mm. as we've seen like yesterday no one really cares about that piece of news but the minister of heritage we're talking about ministers here in israel yeah say that bombing gaza with a nuke is an option now that has many implications one of them is definitely collective punishment the other is genocide yes the the third is israel has nukes that it's been hiding for decades yeah. and not saying anything about them and it's willing to use them uh with full backing from uh, the US and its partners so we're looking at a at an insane uh, government full of fascists that are willing to do anything to subdue the Palestinian population and the 7th of October is no different mm-hmm. collective punishment is their strategy they've done it in, in Lebanon the Dahia doctrine it became like the the whole doctrine became co- like it started They started calling it the Dahia Doctrine yeah. to refer to Al-Dahia, which is a place in, in southern Lebanon, right. uh, where they raised an entire city, completely bombed it to the ground as a response to Hezbollah, like in, uh, I think it was in 2000. That's when it was called the Dahia Doctrine, mm. for example, that level of carpet bombing an entire city. So uh, it's something that they have in their... Uh, um, in their strategies uh, it's quite striking that you you still find some people that aren't uh, that don't really know uh, that are willing to entertain these ideas of uh, yeah Israel is just targeting uh, is just targeting uh, Hamas members but then it just ends up somehow killing more than 10,000 people right now do you think they believe that or do you think they're willfully ignorant when they think that so I think it's a bit of both uh before uh, before i before how would i explain this i think in terms of uh, of them being willfully ignorant ignorant mm-hmm. i think the vast majority of them uh, the vast majority of them aren't the vast majority of them are deceived brainwashed they're just simply they just simply they even have a word for it like called pallywood you ever hear of it mm. So they think that we just make everything up. Yes. So we were not really suffering. Right. We're not really dying. Yeah. Our bombs aren't being destroyed. Uh, our homes aren't being destroyed. Our kids aren't really uh, under the rubble. Uh, But these are Israelis. I'm thinking more Americans. The American Americans just media. simply don't know anything. Really? Uh, It's just I, ignorance. I, yeah, just like complete ignorance. And uh, I... That's my perception, to be honest. And I haven't been to the US, and no. I honestly don't want to. <laughs> uh, but I don't, uh, I don't know uh, the full image of uh, of what's going through the people in America, like in the US, is in the US. What goes through their minds? I have yeah. no idea. How could they even look at what their weapons are doing? It's it's literally all their weapons. Yes. And then still maintain an idea that the US is trying to maintain peace, like. How could you say that? And then the U.S. goes ahead, goes ahead and says, well, we want Palestinians to live in peace. And then they go uh, give us a, like billions, like just now 14.5, 14.3 billion dollars. And then j- they just announced yesterday another 290 million mm. uh, in, in weapons. And then they look at Palestinians and say, we want them to live in a better situation. Mm-hmm. 
do you mean better situation yeah. when you're funding one side and then they entertain the thought of a two-state solution that, oh, we're still on a two-state solution. We want a two-state solution, but they never even try to enforce anything on Israel. So how do you expect it to uh, to give up some land if you don't entertain, if you don't uh, exert any sort of pressure on it? Hmm. Can I ask you about just staying on the theme of Western narratives? Um, we are led to believe that um, uh, the 7th of October was really when history began. So Hamas undertook this operation. It was a, a terrorist operation in, in their eyes, and um, Israel is responding to its right to defense. It's responding to this operation. And when counter voices talk about context, they quickly shut that down. Um, when we discuss context, explain that to me. Explain what life was like before 7th of October in Gaza and maybe in Palestine generally. I think one of the one of the problems in this kind of uh, thinking, mm. like the general kind of thinking in here is people think that Gaza is an isolated instance. It's not related to Palestine. Right. Uh, and that is that is a an erroneous way of thinking. It it's not right. Right. Gaza is an integral part of Palestine. We feel every hit that happens in the West Bank. We feel everything that happens in Jerusalem in Al-Aqsa Mosque. Mm. Uh, we feel everything uh, that happens to the women of Hebron. Um, and we obviously feel the economic crisis in, in Gaza, which is not something simple. Mm. And even though the resistance has, like, has gone through fights, for economic uh, reasons, purely economic reasons, like uh, there's no uh, doubt about it. Uh, it's, it's trying to get something out of Israel, basically, mm. uh, get some concessions. But we still feel it when anything happens around the West Bank uh, and around like the entire uh, area of Palestine, even including like the the Palestinians inside the occupied territories, in what's known now as Israel. Yeah. Um, if, if we want to look at uh, just a tiny bit of context, just a tiny bit of context of what was happening. Uh, Gaza's economic situation, as I've said, is one side of it. The situation is obviously terrible. A, we've had, this is, this is going to take a bit of explaining. Uh, we've had this uh, thing called uh, the... Qatar fund, basically. Yeah. So Qatar used to give money to the, uh, as in like just pay the salaries yeah. of uh, of people from Gaza and then give some of the poor people like a hundred uh, US dollars a month. Now the way that money comes in, it goes through and comes through Ares, uh, basically like Ares checkpoint on the like the border on the northern side. Uh, that was cut off before the war uh, happened. Mm. Uh, many Palestinian workers, there are many people, obviously, because Gaza's economic situation is is very terrible. Mm. You'll find some people even willing to go and uh, work inside the, the occupied territories. Mm. Um, what they call Israel. What yeah. they call Israel. And, they, yeah. and they're willing to pay them. And they're willing to pay them. Mm. Uh, and they pay them really well, to be honest. So people do that. They're like people go and they, there is a quota of how many people like Israel would accept yeah. uh, to go work there. So that was reduced before the war. Uh, that was reduced, I think, severely before the war. So the economic situation is, in, is, is, is a bit, it's just, not stable as it's always been but it's also become even more terrible over time yeah but it's this time i don't think it's like this time specifically is just not about the economic situation only that's why it's, it was called al-aqsa flood yeah it was directed at al-aqsa mosque so what we've seen in al-aqsa in the past i think uh, sammy made like sammy did a good, very good job in explaining the context there mm. but in uh, in al-aqsa they've been going through what we call as التقسيم الزماني والمكاني which means the the time and place division or uh, 
I don't know how to explain it, like how to give it a term in English, but the time division in Al-Aqsa Mosque is basically Palestinian people aren't allowed to go inside right. Al-Aqsa Mosque from, say, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday from 10 to like 6 or whatever, right? right? So they have a certain times yeah. that Al-Aqsa Mosque is reserved for the Jewish population uh, of yeah. Israel. Yeah. Now, that is that, that started before 2021 and slowly started expanding. Now, this is like Israel's strategy. Mm -hmm. They don't do something so striking so quickly. Mm -hmm. They usually go about it very slowly. Piecemeal. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so slowly they take piece by piece, piece yeah. by piece, piece yeah. by piece. And over time, you just end up not having anything. Mm. Uh, so they started this in 2021, before 2021, like I think a year before 2021, and yeah. it started increasing. In 2021, the confrontation called Sayyid al-Quds, Al-Aqsa Sword, uh, or Al-Quds Sword, Jerusalem Sword, was mainly because of this. Uh, and obviously, as you know, like uh, it, this was like huge news. Everyone knew about it. Where people were beaten inside Al-Aqsa Mosque. And they were uh, they were not allowed. They were sieged inside it, and they went inside and beat them up. And so, after that, rather than Israel realizing, or the Israeli entity realizing, that the Palestinians will just not set aside if you do something, uh, if you if you expand uh, your uh, violations in Al Aqsa Mosque, mm -hmm. they even increase them. They even increased them. So after the after the war, uh, we've seen uh, a large increase in terms of numbers of settlers and uh, yeah, basically settlers that go and uh, like visit Al Aqsa Mosque. Uh, we call it invasion. Yeah, uh, invade Al Aqsa Mosque, including Jordan Peterson, which is very funny. Hmm. Uh, he went with a group of Jewish settlers yes. uh, under Israel's protection. Even though if he asked any any Palestinian like to come in, he would have been welcome. But he chose that side. Um, now we know why. But he went in uh, with this group, and uh, over time, they increased the numbers. Every day they increased the numbers. Every day they increased the numbers, and we're seeing it. And they increased the time. And after a few, uh, after a bit, they started bringing in like uh, I don't really understand the full uh, the full side of it, like from a Ju Judaism perspective. I don't really understand it completely. Right. But uh, I've read. Uh, that they've uh, they've brought four cows, red cows, okay. from Texas, uh -huh. as in like to sacrifice, and uh, why Texas? It, well, they wanted red red cows. Basically, okay. they wanted red cows. I, I don't understand it completely, but they the idea is there is a few uh, sacrifices that they need to make before they bring down Al Aqsa and then build the temple in its place. Right. Basically, yeah. so the way it went. Is they they brought in first the uh, the plant sacrifices and they started walking around with them inside Al Aqsa Mosque. Now people that know entirely like what Judaism says and all of these ideas, which I'm not really very familiar with to be honest, mm. uh, know mm. and have warned us about the seriousness of the of the issue. Right. And with the bringing of the cows, it's it's considered like one of the like the latest steps, basically, like right. before they uh, they try to bring down Al Aqsa. Yes. And then the Israeli government obviously held a meeting under Al Aqsa with all the ministers under Al Aqsa, right. uh, with its base. Like he, th there was pictures of it uh, as a provocation, obviously. And the internal security security minister, time and time again invades Al-Aqsa Mosque and walks around and takes pictures with the Dome of the Rock to provoke the Palestinian people. Mm. Women in Hebron, that's a story I don't think many in the West know about. Four women in Hebron were stripped naked and searched, and if I remember correctly, even taken photographs of mm -hmm. by 50 soldiers, 50 Israeli soldiers, only a few weeks before Al Aqsa flood, right. the seventh of October. Yes, the women in uh, in in Al Aqsa itself were beaten on the grounds of Al Aqsa, and then taken captive or hostage, whatever you like. Hmm. Uh, and our prisoners, the Palestinian prisoners, as well as the administrative 
detainees. Uh, like they call it administrative detention, but it's basically hostage taking. Yeah. Because if you take someone without any charges, basically hostage taking. This is under martial law. This is under army law. Yeah. Yeah. So they take anyone they they feel like they could possibly make a problem for them. So they take him preemptively, really? and they, they they quote it around with these nice words. But it's hostage taking. Mm. Uh, and there's more than a thousand of them in Israeli prisons, right. and they can extend it indefinitely. Um, so we're talking a thousand people. That's not a small number. Yeah, three hundred of them children, and I think more than two hundred women as well. So that's that's very serious for us Palestinian. Our women matter so much to us. Like they mean so much to us. Uh, their honor means too much to us. Mm. We're willing to give lives to protect their honor as well. So taking all of that stuff into context and many more that I probably just simply don't know. And you'll end up with a situation that was reaching a boiling point right. with no possibility for it to... There's no peaceful venues. I'll, I'll tell you something. I'll yeah. tell you something. Uh, a few weeks before a lot of flood, I was very depressed when I saw uh, Netanyahu's map. You remember that? Yeah, at the UN. Yes. Yeah. I saw Netanyahu's map uh, that does not include any any sort of Palestinian entity. Mm. Uh, even even steals the Golan Heights completely, which is very interesting to see. Uh, and kind of like very rude as well in front of the United Nations and people applauding. Like, and then we kept hearing of the Saudi normalization deal, which we could like get to talk a bit yes. about normalization later. Yeah. But as you're seeing all of these things, you're feeling, I literally felt this. I felt as, as a Palestinian, we simply lost. We simply lost. Uh, there is no way, like I reached a level of despair and I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's, that's, that was shared by many other Palestinians. Mm. I talked about this to two of my colleagues in here in London. Yeah. I stopped a meeting just to talk about this. Really? Uh, Non-Muslim colleagues. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. Are, one of them is from Colombia and the other is from Nigeria. Yes. Both of them are Christians. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I think both are agnostic, but, yeah. you know, born Christians. Yeah. And I talked with them and said, guys, I'm really depressed. I think there is no way for us to get anything. I think we've lost. Um, and I think the world has abandoned us, mm. including all the Arab and Muslim countries. There's no one willing to help us. There's no one willing to fight with us yeah. for our cause. And no one seeing us as humans or uh, no one seeing a possibility for us to, uh, to move forward. No one seeing the benefit of standing on our side. They're looking at it as some sort of benefit rather than a duty. Mm. Uh, so I think we've lost. And th that made me reach a level of despair that I just couldn't continue working fine for like two days. I just couldn't. Mm. But then, fast forward a few weeks, a lot of flood happened. I'm pretty sure I wasn't the only one feeling the despair. Let's just keep it at that. Yes. I wasn't the only one feeling the despair. Right. And we've seen how the entire world completely changed mm. after uh, October the 7th. Uh, yeah. Can I ask you about the blockade since, what, 2006, 2007 in Gaza? Um, you've lived most of your life, most of your adult life, in fact, your teenage life under this blockade. Just paint a picture of what that siege or that blockade felt like for you. The blockade is a... It's a tragedy. Mm. It's a tragedy, honestly. Now, it's, it's gone through many phases. Right. It's gone through many phases. The first phase was the most difficult phase uh, when people just simply weren't prepared for it. And uh, we were hit very hard by it. Now, I don't know if you know about the calorie equation. No. So the Israeli ministers uh, decided to calculate how many uh, calories each Palestinian should have in Gaza, and they would only let in that amount. Wow! And uh, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, one of their ministers, probably Avigdor Lieberman, uh, which is now a former minister of defense, mm. said, "We just want Palestinians in Gaza to have their heads above water, but not drowning." Mm. Uh, that's a statement he made. Yes. Um, so they calculated the calories. 
So you can just just by giving you that example, you should have an idea of the the level of control they were exerting. Yes. Uh, now, our electricity, evidently, as this war shows, mm. largely comes from their side. They mm. feed us the electricity and charge us too much money for it. Yeah. Uh, most people think it's a, some sort of charity, but we actually pay too much money. I think we pay more than the UK right. in terms of like how much money we pay for electricity. But we only get like eight hours a day or less if they decide to just try to trigger us a bit so uh, they could kill a few people or whatever. Like they, they keep making these decisions. Mm. Um, so we've uh, we've gone through so much. Uh, in the first years of the blockade, they coincided with the war in 2007-2008, the Furqan War. I think they called it Cast Lead. Cast Lead, Operation yes. Cast Lead. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, we call it Al-Furqan. Mm. Uh, so they uh, they bombed the electricity power station, I mean, in uh, in Gaza. It's the only one. Uh, and it never recovered mm. from from then until now. It never recovered. Yeah. But it partially, partially recovered, not completely. So we we, we have, uh, I think it's feeding like, you, you should probably look it up. Like there's a, there is a, there's more concrete information you could find. But I think it's around 10% <coughs> I think it's around 10% of what Gaza needs. Like, yeah. that's what it can generate. And then Israel feeds us, like, or the Israeli entity feeds us around, like, 40%. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Egypt feeds us, like, 20 or 10 or something. Yeah. And uh, that's that's only in terms of, like, power. In terms of internet, as we've seen in this war, it's completely from their side. So they can just switch it off whenever they decide. Uh, and our uh, Palestinian uh, telecommunication companies aren't uh, able, let's say, to bring in uh, other sources of uh, of internet into the the strip. Yeah. Uh, that's in th- that's in terms of internet. So when when the war uh, in uh, in 2008 2009 start happened, I think if I remember correctly, we had six months, six full months of no power. Mm. That's if I remember correctly, and I'm, uh, I was pretty young back then. Uh, but then we started going through different phases. I remember one of the phases was people were using cooking oil as fuel. Right. And that was one of the worst periods of my of my life wow. in Gaza. Wow. It, the smell, smell in the streets. Right. It's horrific. And the How old were you at the time? I think around like 14, 15. Ah. It's horrific. Really? You you like I pray you never have to smell it. <laughs> it's horrific. It's really, yes. it's it's terrible. And uh, people were using it as fuel because there was just simply no fuel. Mm. And as the time went on, we went through different phases. Mm. But I think m- most of it comes back, it uh, comes down to Hamas's competence. When they first came to power, they were just simply incompetent. Really? They couldn't really, uh, they thought they could govern everything uh, on their own. Yeah. That was one of their mistakes. Uh, but over time, they started to learn and get experience in terms of like dealing with other nations and everything, especially Egypt. Uh, so over time, things started to loosen up. In terms of uh, freedom of movement, that is the that is the worst thing about Gaza. Like we could dedicate an entire like uh, question, like talk about it. Yeah. Like I, I, I could. I could talk about it. It'll probably take me around ten minutes to explain the entire thing. Mm. Uh, it's not simple. That's that was the that is and was one of the most difficult thing about Gaza. Yeah. Uh, difficult things about Gaza. Uh, in the past two years, it's become easier, but it's still not that good, right? Uh, it's still not good, to be honest. Um, so historically, during uh, Hosni Mubarak's time in Egypt, the way the Egyptian authorities deal with uh, with Palestinians is it's terrible. It, it, it's dehumanizing, and uh, it, it's surprising to say that because you would you would expect Egyptians like to feel uh, some sort of like I mean the authorities obviously yes. the people obviously like all yes. uh, love Palestinians and uh, would fight for them. But the authorities, uh, there is there's some sense of enmity uh, and dehumanization from many of their members. Some of their members are good, but the majority uh, treat us uh, 
in a very inhumane way. So you would be left waiting like for hours upon hours just because some officer decided to leave you waiting. Um, so during Hosni Mubarak's time, it was a uh, it was a bit difficult. I went uh, I went for Umrah with my family during Hosni Mubarak's time. Um, we enjoyed the Umrah, obviously. Yeah. But the uh, is that the, the first time you left? That was the first time I left Gaza. Yes. Um, but the, it, it was it was a very very tiring uh, trip. Let's just let's just leave it at that. The yeah, bureaucracy, the administration. You mean? It's not in terms of bureaucracy. It's ah. just dehumanizing. You're just ah. left waiting for seven hours because really? they just want to leave you waiting. Mm. Uh, th- there's just simply no no justification for it. It it yeah. just feel it just seems like it it just seems like they have like a policy of of doing this to uh, to Palestinians during uh, Mohammed Morsi's time. I went out for another Umrah uh, with my family. That that one was simple. That one was simple. We we were let in immediately, mm-hmm. and uh, we faced no problems whatsoever. But then after after that, when uh, when Sisi came to power, mm-hmm. things became even worse than when Muhammad uh, when uh, Mubarak, when yeah. Mubarak was there. Husni. Yeah, yeah. When Mubarak was there. Uh, and when I say worse, I mean. It could reach the level like I went to uh, Turkey in 2016 during uh, during Sisi's time. I think that that was like more of a miracle how I actually made it. The border would close for like four or five months at a time, and then they would open it for one day, let in 200 people, let out 200 people, and then close it back again. Right. And then of the 200 they let in, they would probably uh, question some of them and then return them back. So when I went in. I had uh, another guy coming with me for, for the same scholarship in, in Turkey. Like it's an exchange scholarship, yes. Erasmus actually. Yeah. Uh, and he was uh, he was told to go back for no reason. The guy, I simply like, I I don't think there's anything that could justify it. Like yes. I, I was talking with the guy for weeks before we came to it the border at the same you, time. Could have been Could have been me. Like right. they just out of nowhere decided <laughs> to just send him back with many of the people that made it to their side of yeah. the border. Yeah. Uh, but then I was lit through, which is which is something good. But the way it was just uh, like it was really terrible. Uh, mm. Let's not let's not give this too much time. Like, yes. uh, can, can, can I ask you about? You mentioned the, the civil war between Hamas and uh, Fatah in um, two thousand five, two thousand and six, mm. uh, where in effect the. Um, um, the two sides, the Palestinian side, became split into this bipolar division. Looking back, um, was that a disaster really for for Palestinians? I mean, how did you see it? I know you were very young. How did your family see that at the time? I think there's many sides to this uh, to this question. It's a political uh, question, mm-hmm. after all. Uh, so different people will give you different answers. But the fact is. We had a uh, we had a democratic election, mm-hmm. the first time in our history. Mm-hmm. Um, I obviously didn't partake in it because I was too young. Mm-hmm. Um, but Hamas won, fair and square. They won. Yeah. What should have happened is both sides made made mistakes that day. Right. The western side of the war didn't accept the result of the. Uh, the elections simply because they said, well, if Hamas comes to power and they simply don't agree to the prior uh, agreements we had with the PA, then we can't really deal with them, can we? Right. That's that's their uh, decision. So they were, Hamas said, well, we can't agree on the previous ones because it uh, some of them coincide, uh, I mean, have a direct conflict with our whole existence as a political party, mainly recognizing Israel as a sovereign country deserving of taking some of our land, basically. Um, that is Hamas's position. But Hamas said, we were willing to negotiate new deals along the same lines. We're willing to negotiate. So let's have a round of negotiation. The Western world didn't like that as an answer, mm-hmm. and they simply didn't recognize the elections. What Fatah uh, 
وتفتح thought afterwards was well if the world is not going to accept the elections who cares we'll just stay in power right and uh, Hamas can just go do whatever they can just get back uh, scurrying to their whatever they came from mm. now that obviously resulted into higher tensions higher tensions because ministers were trying to get back were trying to get into their ministries that they were elected for and chosen for but they weren't allowed to um, I think what should have happened is both sides should have re- should have recognized uh, Hamas's victory in the elections mm-hmm. and made concessions. Hamas's main mistake, as I've said, was they thought that they could rule perfectly with no problems whatsoever over a conflicted uh, over a conflicted region, mm-hmm. to say the least, a conflicted region mm-hmm. under occupation without making a, some sort of uh, concessions to the other parties because it won. Now it's thinking in Western uh, terms, but we're not really in a uh, in a free and open state that you can make these uh, these assumptions. These simply don't apply when you're under occupation. Uh, so Hamas made that mistake. And Fatah made the mistake of not giving any concessions whatsoever. They, they wanted to stay in power. Mm-hmm. They've they've been in power for a while. They've been in power for like six and like seven. So that's thirteen years since the Palestinian Authority came into place, like after the Oslo Accords in 1993. Yeah. Uh, so they they weren't willing to give up power. So the overall result was a civil war, mm-hmm. in which Hamas won. Hamas won uh, the civil war as well. Fatah. Uh, Fatah members, like especially the top members of Fatah, fled to the West Bank, uh, and then we went through a a period of uh, infighting because Hamas wanted to maintain order. Before Hamas came to power, um, there is something we call Falatan al Amni, which is uh, I don't I don't know how to uh, translate it correctly, but we, it could be it could be security chaos. Security chaos, wherein like uh, different tribes would have weapons, would have would be armed completely, and they would uh, want to exert their dominance over other nearby tribes. Or if any, say say for example, you go and uh, have a small dispute with someone of that tribe. That tribe could hunt you down during the PA's time in Gaza, right? And you could even get killed for it. Um, and we've seen that many times. So the situation in Gaza was terrible. The authorities had complete control to do whatever they wanted with anyone. It was facing. very authoritarian. You could say that. You could yeah. say that. But at the same time, there was no security. Ah. There was no security. You couldn't be safe uh, when you leave your house, like especially for women. Yeah. Women couldn't feel safe at all. And did uh, things change when Gaza was taken now, over by Hamas? So when Hamas came to power, they wanted to change things dramatically. And that was one of the main things of their uh, election campaign. Uh, they called it uh, الإصلاح, which means change and, uh, reform. and yeah. reform. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so they were very serious about this. And they said, we want nothing to do. Like we want the security chaos to completely end. So when they came to power, they many many transgressions happened. Uh, Hamas went and they fought with the tribes in order to collect their weapons and monopolize the violence in in Gaza. So the, the violence would only belong to the authorities. Mm-hmm. No one else would have any weapons unless they're registered with the authorities, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and they uh, and they created then the uh, uh, yeah like some of the uh, yeah police uh, formations and they maintained order they maintained order but things improved significantly right um because of course the, the western argument is that life under hamas was akin to life under isis it was like mosul it was you know, an authoritarian state where you couldn't even breathe without the consent 
of the Hamas government. You seem to be saying it, it, it wasn't like that. I, I think that's a ridiculous argument. And I yeah. think anyone who's been in Gaza can can say, like, can attest to that. Like, right. were, uh, you, even, were you free? Describe free. That's a philosophical discussion. I wish I could be free. <laughs> uh, so um, in terms of uh, like saying whatever you wanted, uh, in, as in any other uh, country, as in any other, uh, under any political entity, you mm. will uh, have a few or many, depending on the on the situation, depending on where you are, uh, some restrictions on what you say. Mm. But I would say I never really felt it. I would say I never really felt it. Mm. I used to be, I used to openly criticize uh, Hamas's like policies, even to them, like to any person I like I see from from their side. I would criticize, like I say, why did you do this and that? Mm. One of the main things, one of the main criticisms that people held and kept in mind and kept talking about for for the entirety of Hamas's rule in Gaza was the way they handled the uh, uh, the situation after the uh, civil war, mm. the way they handled the tribes. Uh, so one of the tribes, for example, was the Dugmush tribe. Mm. My brother, my brother has many friends in that, in that tribe. And the, the way Hamas handled the situation was reprehensible. They they killed a few people, uh, in in clashes and uh, like armed fighting, basically. And some of their uh, people also did like uh, like transgressed. Um, so people criticized that for ages. Now the person responsible for that in Hamas was uh, uh, was dealt with. Like he was uh, he was he was frozen. We call it frozen. Like as in he he no longer be, is able to to continue in his position. Mm. Uh, and and many of the people there like were dealt with like by Hamas authorities, right. especially the transgressors. Yes. Um, so in terms of criticism, people in Gaza have always been able to uh, to criticize and talk and do whatever. Mm. There's one thing I, I usually say to people that surprises them here. <laughs> I think outside wars, living in Gaza is the most, I think it's the safest, pl I think Gaza is the safest, pl safest place to be at outside <laughs> of wars. Really? It is. Yeah. Uh, in terms of like crime, we simply have none of it. Really? We simply have none of it. Like even though there is a, a dire economic situation, uh, you don't hear about people. Uh, now there is a few like you do hear about like uh, some some crimes like theft or something like that, but you never hear about like murder. You mm. never hear about uh, uh, burglary or like anyone going and stealing things and uh, like going into a bank and then shooting people and like all of these things. They simply don't exist. Mm. Um, Women uh, can can do whatever they want. Now, as in like whatever they want, you could uh, you could obviously as in an Islamic country there, there are some restrictions, mm. uh, but under an Islamic context they can do whatever they want. They can walk freely. They can, can walk freely. They right. can go. They can they can even travel on their own. They can mm. uh, leave uh, during the evenings. They can like uh, in in some other countries like Muslim countries, uh, these things can have some restrictions on them. Mm. Whereas women in in Gaza were. Uh, like practically free, and uh, we have a Christian community. Now that's, uh, that's one of the things people don't uh, yeah. really seem to know. We yeah. have a Christian community in Gaza who just, who just continue to live peacefully, and I have two friends from that community, and they just simply continue to live freely and uh, and do whatever they wanted, including like their prayers and everything in their uh, churches, and no no one uh, no one even uh, no one even tried. To do anything to them. Right. Now, when uh, when it came to extremist groups uh, starting to emerge, now with the rise of ISIS, mm. we we saw a group uh, starting to emerge in Gaza uh, that is very resembling of what, what ISIS has. Mm. Takfiri type of group. Exactly. Right. Uh, the way Hamas dealt with them was swift and brutal. They immediately captured the entire uh, organization, like, and and chucked them in prison mm. immediately. Uh, so, within reason, 
you can say and do whatever you want. Mm. Uh, th- that's basically how how Hamas uh, Hamas's rule was in in Gaza. Can I ask you about? I know I haven't called you in today to discuss the wider political context, but in the press there is a discussion about ethnic cleansing of Gaza. Do you feel that the post conflict Gaza, whatever that means, will be a more diminished, a limited Gaza because great swathes of it will be cleansed? And maybe replaced by either Israeli settlements or um, bigger um, cordons between Israeli, so-called Israeli territory and and Palestinian territory. That would be a nightmare. Mm. Um, I think if you ask any Palestinian, whether it be in Gaza or in the West Bank, they would give you the same answer. <coughs> any person would not want to be under Israeli control. And the PA control does not give you safety, does not give you security, as we've seen in the West Bank throughout the years. Um, The Israeli authorities can just come into the area, barge into anyone's house, get people, imprison them, shoot them in the streets, have checkpoints, uh, strip women naked, as we've seen in Hebron. Uh, And... (laughs) An interesting thing, actually, about the Hebron incident is that they, they announced it. Israelis. The Israelis announced right. it weeks Why? after it happened. Why? It's uh, I can't think of any reason other than provocation. Uh, like the women obviously didn't say it about themselves. Yes. Because it's their honor. But the the Israelis, on the other hand, came out and said, "Well, we did this." Mm. Now, just imagine the level of humiliation they want to impose on us because they know it matters a lot to us. Uh, so, in terms of uh, in terms of Israel having free reign to do whatever it wants in, in Gaza, that is a nightmare. If you ask anyone in, in the West Bank or in Gaza, I mean, if you ask anyone in the West Bank and tell him, would you, would you prefer to live under the Palestinian Authority security uh, during which Israel can come in at any time, shoot mm. people or like capture people and torture them and send them back if they want or just keep them for months or under Hamas's rule, mm. uh, wouldn't we have complete complete security inside the border of, mm. of Gaza itself. Mm. I don't think it's even a discussion to be had. Like, uh, Because simply you have uh, you have freedom to go from all like the northern side of Gaza to the southernmost side of Gaza. You can yeah. talk to people, you can do whatever, right. you can trade, you can, yeah. you can leave Gaza and come back even yeah. though there's difficulties around it. Yes. Uh, but in the end, no one can come barging into your house at 2 a.m. and just capture your children and leave with them. Yeah. Uh, so and if you I, ask anyone in Gaza at yeah, the same time, yeah. would you prefer to live under Hamas's rule in Gaza or mm-hmm. under the PA's rule, as in the West Bank, in like the model we have in the West Bank? Mm-hmm. I do not think anyone in their right mind would say yeah. would prefer the West Bank's model. I think it would be a nightmare, to say yeah. the least. Uh, so, so just to understand that, under the terms of Oslo, uh, the PA were responsible for municipal activities, but... Uh, Israeli government was uh, responsible for security and policing. Is that mm. right? I, I don't really know about that, to be honest with you, yeah. but uh, it wouldn't explain the need for uh, 70,000 members of uh, the Palestinian Authority security forces. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they have 70,000 members, wow, really? 70,000 armed people. Yeah. Uh, whereas if you put it into context, the military wing of Hamas is estimated to have 30,000 people. Mm. So you're talking about an actual, like almost an army. Of, uh, of armed, trained men. Mm. Uh, but usually the way they conduct their operations isn't uh, to secure their people from Israeli uh, invasions and things like that. It's usually to, the other way around, it's usually to stop their people from doing any sort of resistance activities against Israel. So they would be, uh, they would they would be basically conduct the same kind of operations as, uh, as the Israeli authorities. Now there are, as a caveat, there are good people in the Palestinian Authority, obviously. Mm. There's uh, there's many good people in Fatah. Many, many great people in Fatah. Uh, and it has a long history of, uh, of uh, revolutionary uh, uh, ideologies and, uh, and fighting for them. Uh, and fighting genuinely for the freedom of Palestine and for achieving a Palestinian state. But the current uh, iteration of things is very, is highly authoritarian and uh, 
I don't think it's genuinely trying to reach a Palestinian state or an end to the uh, to the conflict at all. I think it's it's more or less trying to uh, yeah, it's, let's just leave it at that. They're not mm. trying to uh, to genuinely build a Palestinian state. I don't know about the Oslo Accord, including what you yeah, said or not. Yeah, yeah. So. Can I can I ask you? I mean, uh, two more questions. I want to get into the current psychology, I suppose, of the ordinary Palestinian, whether in the West Bank or in Gaza. Um, there is a discussion outside of Palestine. I've never really heard this discussion from within, but that may be just because I haven't studied it enough that, you know, it's been many years, uh, 75 years, and, um, you know, resistance has failed in inverted commas. Uh, Israel has increased its settlement activity. Uh, Palestine today is a stub of a state. You know, it, it's really not worthy of, the name, the label, a state anymore because of just how much of it, uh, uh, it has been shred. And so the, the discussion is, and I was speaking to an imam recently, again, outside of Palestine, who, who was suggesting that maybe it's time we need to think about compromise. Maybe resistance has failed us. Maybe normalization of some kind, like of the kind that the Muhammad bin Salman is, is, is currently, the endeavor he's currently engaged in. Maybe that's the only way forward to find some level of peace and contentment for Palestinian people. Is that a discussion within Palestine? Um, no, I'm, I'm from Gaza. Yeah, uh, We're completely secluded from the West Bank. So uh, we don't have a full idea of, mm -hmm. uh, of what the regular West Bank uh, person would know right. or what uh, would, would believe, I think. Yeah. Uh, but we can make some uh, assumptions, yeah. assumptions, yeah. yeah. Um, I think the idea that the resistance has failed is, is ridiculous. Mm. I think it's ridiculous because uh, if we look, if we look uh, at history, did we ever get anything out of the other course? And did we get anything out of the resistance? Yeah, let's let's just leave it at a material state, just mm. material. In 2004, uh, Ariel Sharon, the president, uh, the vice, uh, I mean the prime minister of Israel mm -hmm. at the time, one of the most evil persons in the entire universe, was saying Gosh Gatif, Gosh Gatif, which is a, a former uh, settlement in uh, in Gaza. They want to like uh, bring it back. Right now, you can see the soldiers singing and uh, dancing about it. And Netzarim, the other uh, another settlement in the southern side of Gaza are as important as Tel Aviv. He said that in 2004, 2004. In 2005, he withdrew mm. from the entire area of the Gaza Strip yeah. because of the resistance efforts. The resistance efforts were too strong to the point that he had to make that concession. Now that was very unpopular in his uh, government because obviously he's a right-wing person and his government is likewise. But he withdrew from the pressure the resistance was making. Uh, now, we gained some sort of autonomy over Gaza uh, as a people, I mean, as Palestinian people. It left us in a much better position than being under Israeli uh, uh, security or Israeli jurisdiction or uh, like uh, mercy, let's say, under Israeli mercy. Yeah. In Lebanon, the only thing that gave them back their territory was resistance from Hezbollah's uh, fights. Now, you could uh, uh, agree or disagree with Hezbollah's ideology. Mm. They still had massive fights against Israel, and they, they, they managed to managed to win, mm. win back their territory. Now, since we know that territory was taken back by resistance, if we put it on the side and then think about the other uh, alternative, which is peace and uh, negotiations, right? In 1993, we had the Oslo Accords, which were uh, supposed to give us a uh, some sort of a Palestinian state uh, after a few years, mm. and then an airport and a seaport and like all of these nice things that people should have to mm. live, mm -hmm. and to start a negotiation process to retrieve our prisoners and to build a and to work towards a two-state solution. Right? Mm. That was in 1993. Thirty years later, what have we got? Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Now, there were some advancements in some areas, as in like we got the airport in 2002, mm -hmm. 
they bombed it in 2002 uh, in 2000 but they bombed it in 2002 right yes. so it lasted a whole of two years two years yeah my parents traveled through the airport it was the best time they had mm. that didn't last long um did negotiations ever get us any prisoners out i don't remember i simply don't remember did the uh did the resistance get us any prisoners out they did with the uh, jalad shalit the mm. uh the Israeli uh, prisoner, soldier, yeah. the soldier that the <coughs> that the resistance captured, mm. they got a thousand Palestinian prisoners uh, in exchange for him, including some really high uh, high profile like uh, people. Yes. So I think it's ridiculous. Like uh, I think that whole idea is ridiculous and uninformed. Let's say, let's just say uninformed. Mm. Uh, so highly ignorant, basically. Now. Normalization, on the other hand, is a different story altogether. Mm. From norm- normalization, um, I've, I've listened to a video recently that that's, that describes normalization as an alliance, and I think it, it I think it matches it more than the word normalization mm. or a peace deal. Mm. A peace deal uh, assumes that there was some sort of war beforehand, but there wasn't. Uh, I mean, look at any of the states that have uh, normalized. None of them were at war with Israel. None of them were at active at an active war with uh, with the Israeli entity. Now, uh, Egypt and Jordan were and normalized after wars, right? Their normalization deals are, even though they hurt and even though like to us uh, they they hurt, they're completely different than the normalization deal uh, done by like other governments afterwards. Mm. So right now, if you look at Egypt, for example, they still say the the, the Zionist enemy, for example, when mm-hmm. they want to describe Israel, they want to say Israel, they say the Zionist enemy yes. or the uh, Israeli entity, enemy mm-hmm. state. Or right. They use these terms still yes. in their media, in their uh, education, between themselves as a people. Mm. Whereas if you look at the uh, UAE. Uh, UAE, for example, after yeah. it normalized, yeah. um, you just simply see that as a complete abandonment of uh, the Palestinian cause, as if, as if it's a bypassing the Palestinian cause in order to serve our economical interests. Yes. And I mean, I could understand that if you were, uh, if you didn't really have any sort of uh, ideological backing, but if you, uh, if you claim to have any ideological backing, you can't really do that uh, because you're, you're accepting, you're, ac- you're accepting that these people will have to continually suffer under Israel's control. Yes. Um, I think that's that's majorly it. From uh, w- when you look at uh, at some of these uh, big countries that, that, that are making the, these decisions, what have they ever, since they started the normalization deals, what have they ever gotten the Palestinian people? The UAE, for example, Normalize in exchange for the Palestinian people mm. to stop the expansion of the settlements. Yeah. Well, that's great if it happened. Yes. Uh, how long did it stop? 24 hours. And huh. They continued again. Now, if you look back, and uh, there, there was a video released uh, recently, so I'm, I'm not even saying anything from my own accord. I'm saying from them. There was a video uh, from the UAE ambassador to the US saying our normalization deal with Israel has largely failed to get anything for the Palestinians. I think uh, I think Sammy also said that same point. It has largely failed to give anything to the Palestinians. Mm. So if you if you admit to that, then you know for a fact that you're not going to get anything. That that you're dealing with an entity that is not really interested in any sort of peace. Mm. That entity conducted so many wars over the region, and it thrives on its sale of weapons, it thrives on it. So if even if you manage to get it to stop, it will still find some conflict so that it can use its weapons on and start selling them. That's exactly what it's been doing in Gaza. For example, throughout the past 31 days or 32 days now, I think, in this current uh, war, and I hope it ends soon, we've been hearing constantly about new sorts of weapons being used. Now, I lived in Gaza my whole life. I know what Israeli bombs sound. We know them by the sound, right? Imagine living under that situation to actually know a bomb by the sound. Mm. And we now 
many of my friends are telling me that these are completely new sounds and these are doing completely new things yeah. uh, like the seismic for example bombs uh, that dig under the ground in hypersonic speed dig like meters under the ground then explode underground yeah. in a shaking motion that can shake the entire region as if like as, as if like an earthquake yeah. there's other uh, i don't know the name in english thermo bio whatever mm. uh, bomb that that explodes it, it, it's in midair well the one in midair yeah. is not that is ah. a That's the MK82. That's ah. an American bomb. Okay. It can explode in midair and yeah. it can explode when it hits. Ah. Uh, so it has two modes. You can you can choose. Sure. Uh, but this 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 one, the way it functions is that it explodes. But the idea isn't to kill by sharpness and everything. Yes. The idea is to kill by pressure. Mm. So if you've seen the photo of uh, I mean the video from uh, the uh, the spokesman for the Ministry of Health. Uh, Two days ago, he was holding a dead baby on the ground yeah. and speaking to the international community saying, stop this and help us, bring us some aid and stop the situation, call for a ceasefire. And yeah. it was a like a highly emotional, uh, let's say, a highly emotional uh, talk by that person uh, as he's holding that dead baby. Like imagine having to be like put in that situation to explain to the world that you're human and you deserve some empathy. The baby has no problems whatsoever. If you look at his body, no blood, nothing. No looks perfect. wounds. He looks perfect. Yeah. Uh, and I was on the phone with uh, one of my doctor friends, and he said this kid must have died from an in, inner explosion of his inner uh, body part. So these are weapons that we're not used to. Now <laughs> we're used to other weapons, which is uh, still tragic. But these are things that we're not used to. White phosphorus is being used at an unprecedented uh, uh, rate. Uh, rate, yes. Yeah. So uh, even though they've used it before in 2008, including at UN schools, mm. we have that in photos. Yes. Still disputed and uh, being uh, investigated in the International Criminal Court as if as if the photos and everything don't exist. Yeah. Um, and it's been used in Lebanon, but right now. It's being used every single second. Just you need to just open Al Jazeera Arabic Live, and just watch as they raise an entire city live on TV. And white phosphorus is being used constantly, constantly all over the area. And then they bomb it, and then they use white phosphorus again just to make sure that none of the people could even uh, stay alive in the region or be able to flee. Mm. So in terms of weaponry, they they keep using it, uh, using new weaponry constantly. So even if even if you manage. Even if you manage to stop that for a while, they will need to find some kind of conflict because the only reason they exist is to sell weapons. Like they, I think that there's many reasons they exist, but one of the main reasons, one of the things that their economy lies on uh, or relies on is the sale of weapons. Mm. Uh, and the tragic thing in it is many Arabic countries buy the weapon. Uh, so they just wait for them to be used and, and they buy them, uh, which is a huge tragedy. Obama, um, one last question for you. I mean, just earlier today, I watched a video of two ambulance drivers. You may have seen this. Oh, and, yes. Um, they were drinking juice and uh, laughing and saying, you know, maybe this is the final drink we'll, we'll drink and maybe our next drink will be in Jannah. And you saw a level of Iman which was uh, just outstanding. You know, it, it was perfection in some respects you know when we when we observe from the outside of course um and um i want to ask you the question what what lay lies behind this fortitude this resolve that we see amongst the people of gaza you're from this this area how do they exhibit at such a time of adversity such high levels of belief and faith i think you would be here I think you would be surprised uh, by how much faith dire situations give you. Mm -hmm. um, so I would I would give the Gazan people or the Palestinian people in general we're, mm -hmm. we're resolute people. Yes. We would have disappeared if if it hadn't been for seventy five years of fighting. Yeah. Um, so I I would give us some credit towards that end, but I would still I would still also 
talk about how any people put under extreme oppression uh, and constant violations of their rights, they will rise up and their their faith will increase. Uh, now I don't wish that upon any 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 person. It's 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 a huge pressure to be under, and it's a huge uh, bla. It's a huge uh, uh, strife. Yes. Yeah. Um, and you could fail at the test. You could fail. But many people, I think the majority of people, their faith increases with the level of uh, with the level of uh, pressure they're put under. Uh, and I think we're no different. I I look at the people of uh, Bosnia mm -hmm. and the level of faith they had during their war. I look at the uh, I look at many of the other peoples around, uh, like the Syrian people, the Uyghur population, the Rohingya in, uh, in Burma uh, and Myanmar, and it's it's always stories upon stories of people striving for their uh, for their rights and their freedom and with with faith, mm -hmm. with extreme faith, and you could uh, you could still find people doing similar things, even with with less, uh, without a, let's say, an ideology of uh, a, like grounded in Islam or in some sort of faith or an afterlife or something mm -hmm. like like Vietnam, for example, and how they fought bravely against the uh, US occupation. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, I think faith gives you a huge, a huge uh, strength and uh, resilience that, that other ideologies simply can't. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we saw the people of Afghanistan fight against the U.S. occupation barefoot for 20 years until they managed to get their uh, their freedom uh, and how the Iraqi people fought valiantly mm. against the U.S. occupation. Um, and of course, like the Afghanis, how, how they fought against the Soviet occupation yes. beforehand. Yeah. So we're looking at uh, being put under extreme situations gives you strength and resilience. Um, I think w one of the reasons we have, uh, w we get the feeling to fight on is because Palestine is a central issue for Muslims, right? It includes Al-Aqsa Mosque. It is the one, it's the one country in the world that is still colonized. It is the one country in the world that is in the old way of colonizing if you ignore the new colonialism mm. and it needs to be dismantled so the entire world uh, feels it the entire world uh, relates to it so when we see the people all around the world rising up going for protests as we've seen around in in london in washington uh, mm. and of course in baghdad mm. like a million people came up in baghdad in mm. jakarta a few mm. days ago two million people in jakarta mm. so we're looking at insane numbers of people willing to do anything, willing to go out in the streets and protest this, this gives us way more strength, way more strength than you could imagine. And I think other peoples that don't have this uh, kind of focus on their issues, I, I really feel sad for them. I really feel sad for them because Uyghurs, of this point. The, Syrians, the Uyghurs, yeah. the, like the, the problems that Indians, uh, Indian Muslims face in mm. India, they're, they're unspeakable. Yeah. But we don't really see that much, uh, that strong feeling of uh, of like solidarity, solidarity yeah. that you're used to. Yeah. Uh, in the end, uh, I just want to just end on this point. We're really just people. <laughs> We're really just people. We're, we love life. Uh, we love each other. We love our friends. We love our families. We love our kids. I would do anything not to see any of my... Uh, nephews or nieces uh, get killed for example I would do anything and I hope none like no harm comes to them over the course of this war yeah. or any to come we love food we love to go out yeah. we love to we love to eat we love to like we love to sit around with other people we love to contribute we love to we love life we're not a people that loves death and would like to do everything in like just to achieve a cause or something. No, we love life. And we would be willing to do anything to live. But we value freedom more. Mm. 
we value freedom more than just simply living uh, and as long as we're living under this constant occupation this constant oppression this constant bombardment that Israel calls mowing the lawn in Gaza and uh, and all of this uh, oppression we will keep fighting generation after generation you can't really get rid of us uh, people people will still rise up and want to keep fighting not because we hate life but because we love it and that's that's i think the the whole thing that's the whole idea Rabbi Amar Abdul Latif Jazakallah khair thank you very much for your time today. thank you for having me thank you please remember to subscribe to our social media and youtube channels and head over to our website thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter Jazakallah khair